There's a word that's used many times in the scriptures, the little word A-L-L, all. For instance, in Isaiah 53, 6, we're told, All we like sheep have gone astray, and the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. I'm glad that since all went astray, that the iniquity of all is taken care of. There's another scripture that says, All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, and instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. 1 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. Now we found out yesterday that uh, part of this scripture that's, you, that's termed all is to be found in Zechariah chapter 12, verse 12. And when Paul wrote this in Timothy, that was 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17, wasn't it? Is that 1 Timothy? Okay. Zechariah 12, 12. At the time that Paul wrote to Timothy those words, very little, if any, of the New Testament was in print or in writing. And so he was referring primarily to Old Testament scriptures. We find then part of inspired scripture, which is profitable, reads thusly, Zechariah 12, 12, And the land shall mourn, every family apart, and the family of the house of David apart, and their wives apart, and the family of the house of Nathan apart, and their wives apart, and the family of the house of Levi apart, and their wives apart, and the family of Shimei apart, and their wives apart, and all the families that remain, every family apart, and their wives apart. And we're supposed to get a blessing out of these verses. And we're supposed to find something in there that thrills our soul, and we're supposed to find something in there uh, for our learning, for our doctrinal understanding, for our correction, for our reproof, for instruction in righteousness. And we found out yesterday that the way to do this is to place the Lord Jesus Christ right into the middle of it. Well, maybe you've had some problem doing that. Now, one of the teenagers says that he has answer to this riddle, but he won't tell anybody. So uh, we'll just have to go on with another clue. So far, uh, we said that this Shimei involved here is the Shimei that's discussed in uh, the later chapters of uh, Second Samuel and the first two chapters of First Kings. Now you notice you have five groups of people. You have the family of David. He was a king. You have the family of Nathan. He was a prophet. You have the family of Levi. He was a priest. And then you have the family of Shimei. We don't know what he was doing. And then you have the other families. So you have five groups of people, don't you? Now, all of these people lived at the same time that we're discussing here. You might uh, be thrown off by Levi, but you see, at the time David was king, Nathan was the prophet. And there was more than one priest, so they are described simply as the sons of Levi, or the descendants of Levi, who was the third son of of Jacob and from whom the priestly uh, descendants came. So the prophet Zechariah here is writing about a group of people that lived some 400 years, 400 and some years before he did. This, these people that are mourning here actually lived about a thousand years before Christ. But Zechariah is prophesying about 500 and some years before Christ, or long after these folks are dead. But he's speaking of a future time. The time of which Zechariah is prophesying here has not yet come. It's still future to us. So here's Zechariah, 500 and some years before Christ. He's looking backwards to a group of people who lived several hundred years previously, and he's prophesying about something in which these folks will be involved in the future. Now, that ought to be enough clues for this morning, hadn't it? Now remember what we're looking for. We're looking something here for something for your own self, for your own instruction, for your own uh, correction, for your own reproof. So we'll let it go there, and we'll see how we come out tomorrow. 
Now we can turn to our theme scripture for the week, that is to say, 1 Corinthians, the 6th chapter. Maybe by the end of the week we'll know how to find 1 Corinthians anyway. Our children over here have grown up since yesterday morning, haven't they? I don't know what we'll do without their inspiration. The teenagers won't sit near the front. They get way back there, so I can't even see whether they're scowling at me or whether they're smiling. One wiggled a finger. First Corinthians, the sixth chapter, in the nineteenth verse. <coughs> what? Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you? whom ye have of God, and ye are not your own, for ye are bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's." Now yesterday we learned something about this buying process. We learned that to, uh, that to be bought in this manner was to be redeemed or purchased again out of the marketplace, out of the slave market. The inference here is that Someone owned us, and we either defected or were captivated by someone else. And the original owner had to pay a price to get us back again. Now, he must have wanted us quite badly, especially considering the price that he paid. Well, this morning, we want to discuss this word temple, and we want to talk about the word glorify. We'd like to explore just exactly what Paul means when he speaks of our bodies as being a temple. And we want to find out just what it means to glorify God. Well, let's start with the word glorify. The word glory means excellence on display. If you want to show forth the glory of anyone or any place, you show forth its excellence. Down in Florida, we're known as a tourist state. And we spend much money in the glorification of our state all over television programs and so forth. We display the excellence of our state. We glorify it. So to glorify something is to display its excellence. And the glory of God is the excellence of God on display. That's what it means. So this means that in our bodies, God's purpose is that we shall display his excellence from the vantage point of our bodies. Now, it does seem that God could have chosen a better vantage point, doesn't it? But regardless, he didn't. He chose that his excellence should be displayed from our own bodies. Now, three times in the New Testament, our bodies are called the temple of God. Once in the third chapter, 1 Corinthians, once in the sixth chapter, 1 Corinthians, and once in the sixth chapter of 2 Corinthians. Two other times in the Bible, certain Bible writers called their own bodies tabernacles. In the fifth chapter of 2 Corinthians, Paul refer, refers to his body as a tabernacle. He says uh, that I'm now in this tabernacle and it would be better if I were clothed with something else. But it's necessary that I be clothed in this tabernacle while I'm here. Then in the first chapter of 2 Peter, Peter speaks of his body as a tabernacle. He says that uh, while he's in this tabernacle, that he thinks it's uh, important that he... Uh, give instruction, and he says, because God has shown him that he will soon put off his tabernacle. And he's speaking of his body, he's speaking of the time when he will be separated from his body in physical death. Now what would you say is the difference between a temple and a tabernacle? Why, uh, why are our bodies described by God as being temples, and yet at the same time, Peter and Paul both call their bodies tabernacles. 
Well, to understand this difference, let's go back into the history of mankind. If you were to take the chronology of the Bible in its very plainest language, you would come up with the information that Adam was placed here approximately 6,000 years ago, or about 4,000 years before Bible times. Now, there are some good Bible scholars that take this 4,000-year period to be figurative rather than literal, and they place uh, Adam's existence at some considerable earlier date. My personal opinion is that when you get to glory, you'll find out that it was God's purpose to let man run this world for 6,000 years, and that 6,000 years is almost over. The 7,000th year, it will be run by the man, Christ Jesus. Now, I'm not speaking of the existence of the earth. If you're troubled about uh, how did the petroleum get here and the coal and so forth, well, uh, that's a different story, and that's not part of what we're talking about today. We're talking about when Adam was placed here, and his best I can determine from the plainest reading of the Bible and the study of the uh, genealogies and the chronologies in the Bible, the Bible seems to indicate to me that Adam was placed here about 4,000 years ago. Now, at that time, God purposed that man should live 900 and some years. Man was not permitted to live for a thousand years because the Bible says that to God, a thousand years is, is, is as a day, and a day is as a thousand years. And in the day that Adam sinned, he should die. And every man would have to die within the thousand years uh, from which he came on the scene of this earth. That's only one aspect, however, uh, of Adam's death. He died in three ways, body, soul, and spirit. And we're only speaking here of his bodily death. <clears throat> But Adam lived for almost a thousand years, or nine hundred and some years, and all of those patriarchs lived for nine hundred and some years. Climactic conditions were different at that time. Uh, chemical structures and reactions were different, obviously. Uh, there were no such thing as predatory animals. Uh, everything ate vegetable matter uh, rather than meat. Uh, so. The Bible tells us that people live this long, and people live this long for about ten generations. And the end of ten generations, we're told in the sixth chapter of Genesis that all of mankind had perverted himself. And although man knew God by the creation, he chose to walk a path away from God. Until in ten generations, with that type of longevity, Millions of people were on the earth, and there was only one godly family in all the earth, Noah and the seven additional members of his family. And there was no hope of salvaging all of the other families of the earth. In fact, as they brought others in, they were, they were simply, you might say, breeding more fodder for hell. And God says, if man continues to get more corrupt, that pretty soon he's going to annihilate himself by his own viciousness and by his own sinfulness. And so if I'm going to save the human race, I'm going to have to wipe off of the face of the earth all but this one godly family, and that's what he did in the flood. Noah lived ten generations after Adam. And so God started over again some 1,600 years after Adam. He started over again with one godly family. And at that time, there were only these eight people on the whole earth, and obviously everybody was godly. Well, God saw that it just wouldn't do for man to live 900 years, and so he cut the life, the longevity of man, exactly in half. If you'll read the chronologies, you'll find that for two or three generations after the flood, the men lived 400 and some years instead of 900 and some years. It was not a gradual decrease. It was a precise cutting in two of the period of longevity. Now, this didn't affect Noah because he lived for 900 and some years. Neither did it affect his sons because we find that Shem was still alive 500 and some years after the flood. But all the descendants of those who were on the ark uh, were limited to 400 and some years. And then after a few generations, God discovered that 
man just got into too much mischief in 400 and some years, so he cut the longevity in half again. And for some several generations, men lived to be 200 and some years, and then they died. Now, all of this can be read in the early chapters of Genesis. You can put this all together if you study those, those chapters carefully. Well, then, because God decided 200 and some years was too long, he let the longevity of man gradually decline. For instance, Abraham lived 175 years. Jacob lived 147 years, Joseph lived 135 years, and Moses lived 120 years. And by the time you get down a thousand years before Christ, longevity was about 70 years. And it continued dec to decrease until the time of Christ, the average lifespan was less than 30 years through the ravages of disease and iniquity. And, it was, and, it, and everywhere in the world today, this is still true. You go to any tribe of the world where Christianity has never been named, and the longevity is somewhere around 30 years or less. But as soon as Christianity comes on the scene, the longevity almost immediately arises to around 70 or 80 years. You can check this out with your anthropologist or uh, those folks, and you will find that this is true. Now, ten generations after Noah, as far as the Bible account indicates, there was only one righteous man on all the earth. And there were millions of people here again, and everybody had perverted themselves and gone away from God again. Remember, this is the second time that God uh, started over with the human race. But you see, as the Bible says, we all go astray even from the womb. We turn from our God and go our own ways, so that as near as we can tell, ten generations after the flood, Shem was still alive. One of the sons of Noah was still alive, and as far as we can tell, he was the only godly man in the whole earth, and he was about to die. So that God would have no communications with the human race because everybody had turned aside. Well, God's remedy was to call a man out of an idolatrous family, and his name was Abram. If you didn't know that Abram came from an idolatrous family, you can read the 24th chapter of Joshua, and Joshua will tell you that he did. So in order to keep a witness of some kind on this world, God called out one particular man. Now, he picked a man that had no children and who was uh, rapidly approaching the age in which he could father children no longer. He did that on purpose. So in one sense, God didn't actually choose a nation for himself. He chose one human being. And uh, after a few more years, this one human being still had fathered no children. And he got concerned about God's promise to him that he would father a great nation. And so he and his wife got together and they concocted a system. Uh, they figured that it was her baroness that was causing the problem. And so they got a, a servant girl. and. Uh, managed to uh, uh, propagate a son named Ishmael. But that wasn't God's plan at all. God wanted to wait until Abram and Sarah, Sarah both were totally incapable of childbirth. And he did wait that long. And he rejected Ishmael. And he miraculously brought about the birth of Isaac. Now, the reason God did it that way, because he wanted a person on whom the human race had no claim. Isaac doesn't even belong to the human race from a natural standpoint. God brought him about miraculously, and he's therefore a type of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, he had a true earthly father and a true earthly mother, but his birth was no less miraculous. God rejuvenated the bodies of Abraham and Sarah so that what God was doing, you see, let's take the whole human race as a great flowing river, a river that was flowing madly away from the destination that God had chosen for the river. Now, what God was doing, he was taking a little stream out of that river and, and shutting it aside like a mill stream, you know. Uh, when, you, when you want to uh, establish a mill by the side of a river, you don't take the whole river 
you channel a little stream out of the river. That is to say, if it's a great river, you channel a little stream out of the river and you control that stream and that stream does the work and then it goes back into the river. Well, God, what God was doing with Abraham and Isaac, the son of Abraham, was taking just a little tiny stream out of this great flow of humanity and he was going to control that little stream and he did this. And you'll recall that uh, Isaac had two sons. God rejected one of them, and that is he let him go back into the river, the broad stream of humanity which was flowing away from God and wanted nothing to do with grinding mill, grinding grain for God. He them down into the land of Egypt, and God saved them out of captivity after they became uh, a nation of some three million or more souls. And then he tested them in the wilderness. And then he brought them in to a special land, a protected land, a land that had a great river gorge on one side and a huge sea on the other, mountains on the north and deserts on the south, an easily defended nation, a well-watered land. And he brought them in there. And his purpose for bringing them in there was to train them in his ways that they might take the message of the goodness of God to the ends of the world. See, he was going to channel this stream back into the main river so that the whole river might learn how it is to be under the control of God. But the little stream became rebellious and it didn't want to go back into the river. And the whole world never learned of the goodness of God because the stream didn't do its work. Now, Some several centuries after God uh, established this system of uh, taking a stream out of humanity, remember, the river rejected God twice. The river, the great river of humanity, rejected God completely. And that's, that brought, brought about the Noah's flood. And then again, the great river of humanity rejected God completely. And for that cause, God chose out Abraham. And then the little riverlet the one nation with whom God was dealing and upon whom God dealt special favor. They weren't doing everything just right either. But God continued to work with them and train them. And some 400 years after he brought them into this wonderful land, he permitted them to build a beautiful building, a temple. Now, up to that time, God's presence had been manifested among his people in what was known as the tabernacle. The tabernacle was a, a building which is described very minutely twice in the book of Exodus, once in uh, describing the plans of how it was to be built, and then again in the plans as how it was built. And this building, uh, which was called a tent, or tabernacle because it was a tent. The word tabernacle originally simply meant a temporary dwelling place. And it came to mean a tent because tents are temporary dwelling places or were used such. And later on, it just came to mean a dwelling place. But the original meaning of the word tabernacle was a temporary dwelling place. And in this temporary dwelling place, God had a curtain all the way around, seven and a half feet high, so that nobody from the outside could see in and nobody from the inside could see out. And this was emblematic of the fact that God's presence and God's glory was not to show forth on the earth until his own people had properly learned him. And then God's plan was to tear down the walls of the tabernacle, that the, the presence of God might shine out to the whole world. So. As long as God's presence was manifested there in that little holiest place within the tabernacle, the glory of God did not shine forth to the world. As a matter of fact, it was con confined to one little dark cubicle into which one man was permitted to go once a year, the high priest. So God's glory did not show forth from the tabernacle. That was not the purpose of the tabernacle. It was a temporary dwelling place for God, and it was never God's intention that he should be glorified through the tabernacle or that the physical tabernacle should be a place from which his glory shone forth on this earth. In fact, it was cooped up there 
on purpose, and, uh, and uh, only available to this special people who were to learn of God. However, a thousand years before Christ, God has, had established a great nation on this earth, the greatest nation uh, in some regards that had ever been. And the king was King David, once uh, especially chosen of God. And it was this kingdom's job to glorify God, to show him forth, and to take his wonders and his works to all the ends of the earth. This was the purpose of the kingdom under David. And you'll remember, when David died, his son was permitted to build a beautiful building, a very opulent building. If you want to read the story of the building of this building, you'll find it in the early chapters of the book of 1 Kings, and you'll find the story repeated again in the early chapter, chapters of the book of 2 Chronicles, 1 Kings and 2 Chronicles, the early chapters in both places. And you will be amazed if you just realize the tremendous dimensions and opulence of this building. And in the center of it, God uh, was a place for God's presence to be manifested. It was called the holiest place, and there was a little ark made of wood, a little box-like affair, made of wood and overlaid with gold, which speaks of the humanity and the deity of Christ. And the cherubim, who are God's representative on earth, spread their wings over the top of this little chest-like affair, and just above the wings of the cherubim there was a brilliant light called the Shekinah glory of God, and it glowed there very brightly. And the, uh, the thought was that from that point the glory of God or his divine manifestations were to be shown forth into all the world. The people there were to learn how to worship God and glorify him. And so the temple was a place from which the glory of God was to emanate to all the world. That's what the temple was for. Well, it took Solomon seven years to build the temple. Now, the materials for the temple had been, gathering, been gathered together many years previously under the reign of King David. But there the... Uh, the building was uh, constructed, and you have this story in 1 Kings chapter 8 and in 2 Chronicles chapter 5. Then it is, we're told in both of these chapters, that when the building was completed and dedicated, that the glory of God came and filled the whole building so that the priest could not even come near it. That is to say, this, this uh, Shekinah glory or this brilliant point of light which normally would stay just in the holiest place, flooded that whole building to show that God accepted it as his point of reference on earth, as his dwelling place. So the glory of God entered the, the, the temple there in Jerusalem. And the glory of God remained in that temple for around 400 years. That is to say that every time the high priest went inside the holy place, he could see the brilliant light of the Shekinah glory and be reminded of the fact that the nation of Israel was to transport the glory of God to all the ends of the earth. But instead of doing that, the nation of Israel turned to their own private affairs. They worshipped as they pleased rather than as God prescribed, and they went about their lives to suit themselves until it was soon said every man did that which was right in his own eyes. Well, the idolatry became so bad and the iniquity became so terrific that God finally said, it's a perversion of my righteousness for me to even claim to be among you people. And if you don't straighten up in a hurry, I'm going to let some great nation come and take you into captivity and your whole temple and your whole city and all that you possess will be laid waste and we'll just postpone this matter of taking my glory to the ends of the earth because you're not proper vessels to do it. But they didn't heed God's warning. And in the book of Ezekiel, and we'll look into this in a little later, in the book of Ezekiel, in chapters 8 through 12, you have the story of the departing of the glory of God from this temple in Jerusalem. This happened about 600 years before Christ was born. The glory of God departed from the temple there. 
And there was no temple in Jerusalem. In fact, it was utterly destroyed. <clears throat> there was no temple there for 70 years. And then God permitted a little group of his people to come back under Ezra and to rebuild the temple. The rebuilding of this temple, uh, the story of the rebuilding of this temple <clears throat> is told in the first chapters, first few chapters of the book of Ezra. And the completion of the temple is described in the sixth chapter of the book of Ezra. But the glory of God didn't come back to that temple because, you see, his people were not their own people. They were under Gentile domination because of the times of the Gentiles or the times of the nations of the world or that time when God just let the nations of the world overflow the world and when he took his presence away from the world to let it sour and steep in its own iniquity because the nations of the world were in control and had rejected God. God did not come back with his presence in that temple. You will find no account, although that temple is described in many places in the Bible. We have a story, for instance, by the prophet Haggai, or Haggai, which is the third from the last book in the Old Testament, in the second chapter of Haggai. A scene is described there of when the old people, the old uh, uh, fathers of the nation who had even seen Solomon's temple. They were some of them a hundred years old and they looked upon this new temple and they wept because it lacked so much in comparison. But Haggai said in the, in the second chapter of Haggai, he says, don't weep because one day there's going to be a temple sitting here, the glory of which will far outweigh the glory of the former temple. Now that has not happened yet. But one day, on that same spot in Jerusalem, there's going to be a glorious temple from which the, the opulence of God and the excellence of God will be on display for this whole world. Now, the building of that temple, that glorious temple, is minutely described in the book of Ezekiel again, beginning with about the 40th chapter. Haggai prophesied that there would be such a temple, and Ezekiel describes that temple for us. So now you see, we've described three temples, haven't we? We've described the temple that was built under Solomon. It's known as Solomon's temple. That stayed for 400 and some years. And then we've described Ezra's temple, the rebuilding of the temple. Well, that one was destroyed several hundred years before Christ, a hundred and some years before Christ. God's glory never returned to that temple. Then if we read the New Testament, we find the story of another temple, don't we? A third temple that was built by Herod, who wasn't even a member of the Jewish nation. He was an imposter. But he built one and he tried to outdo, he tried to outdo uh, Solomon. He wanted his temple to be greater than Solomon's temple. But God's glory didn't return to that temple either. Now we have four temples we've described. We've described the temple, the, the first one that was built under the reign of Solomon, into which the glory of God entered and from which the glory of God departed 400 years later. Then we have, secondly, the temple, uh, the rebuilding of the temple under Ezra, some 500 and, year, 500 and some years before Christ. That temple w uh, stayed for a couple of hundred years and was destroyed. The glory of God never entered. Then we had the temple, which was present at the time Christ came upon the scene, Herod's temple. There's the third one. Then we found out that there's going to be another one, still future. Well, there's, since there's seven temples, we've left out three, haven't we? Well, we know what the seventh one is. The seventh one is that one, which was described by Haggai, the prophet, as being greater than that one built by Solomon. And it's the same one that's described, the building of which is described by Ezekiel. Well, in the 11th chapter of Revelation, you have a short description of a temple that will be built during the time of Jacob's troubles, that is, the time of the Great Tribulation, which is still future. That one will only last a short while, and it will be inhabited by the desolation of abomination. 
That is to say, the Antichrist will take it over and do his own thing there. So altogether, you have five physical buildings, all to be built on the same spot, all to be built in Jerusalem. We need two more. We need two more. We've, we've had five. Now, I want to describe those five for you again so that you'll get it in your mind's view. There needs to be seven, totally. Number one, the temple that Solomon built, which was supposed to be that temple from which the glory of God or the ec God's excellence on display was to be taken to all the nations of the world. Solomon's temple lasted 400 and some years, destroyed by the armies, armies of Nebuchadnezzar after the departing of God's glory. We're going to see this in Ezekiel in just a few minutes. Temple number one. Temple number two. Ezra brought back from captivity 500 and some years before Christ, a group of Israelites, and they rebuilt the temple on the same site. The description of that culminates in the sixth chapter of Ezra. Number two, the glory of God did not come back to that temple. Number three, Herod began at the construction of a very opulent temple before the birth of Christ, and it was 46 years in building. And it was there all during the life of Christ. The glory of God never came to that temple. It was used primarily by the money changers and so forth when Christ was here. That's, uh, that's number three. One, two, three. Number six. Let's skip four and five. Number six will be built by Mr. 666 or he will be built under his uh, blessing, be built by the nation of Israel, but he will take it over, and he will be worshipped from that temple in Jerusalem at the same spot during the time of the tribulation. You can read all about that worship in the 13th chapter of Revelation. That's temple number six. Temple number seven is the one that will be built immediately as soon as the king comes back to this earth, and the glory of God will again enter that temple, and it will be a greater temple, Haggai says, than Solomon's temple, and it will be in Jerusalem throughout the millennial reign of Christ, and the glory of God will show, show forth from that temple. So we have then one, two before the birth of Christ, one during the birth of Christ, number three, two yet to come, and we've left out number four and five. Well, first, let's, let's find out about number four. And we find out about that temple first in the Gospel of John, the second chapter. The Gospel of John, chapter four. No, chapter two. John 2.18, Then answered the Jews and said unto him, What sign showest thou unto us, seeing that thou doest these things? He's just run all the money changers out of the temple there that Herod built. 19th verse, Jesus answered and said unto them, Destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. Then said the Jews, Forty and six years was the temple in building, and wilt thou raise it up in three days? But he spoke of the temple of his body. You see, when Jesus Christ came, it was from his body that the glory of God should show forth. The excellence of God was on display in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, John prophesied this in John 1, 10, and 1, 14. <clears throat> Notice John 1, 14. And the word which made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory as the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. This is the same Shekinah glory <clears throat> that was in the Solomon's temple. And Peter describes it again for us when he, he says that this glory shone forth on the Mount of Transfiguration, when Christ, uh, was, his body was illumined uh, uh, with fluorescence, you might say, a glorified body. So you see, the glory of God departed from Solomon's temple 600 years before Christ, and the glory of God was not present 
God's glory was not being manifested on this earth for 600 years from the time his people went into captivity until Christ came on the scene. And then he became the temple of God, or that dwelling place of God, from which the excellence of God shone forth to all the world. So Jesus Christ is then the temple of God, the earthly dwelling place of God from which his glory shone forth. And the same purpose, the same purpose of God was to emanate from the body of Christ as emanated from the temple at Solomon, the same purpose. That is to say, when Christ came, his people were to receive him as the Shekinah glory, as the presence of God, as the glory of God manifested, and from that point they were to spread the goodness of God to all the nations of the world. Jesus Christ offered himself to his own people as the Shekinah glory of God and as the king from whom the presence of God would go forth. But he came unto his own, the Bible says, and his own received him not. The Shekinah glory again was snuffed out. Now why was it snuffed out? Well, in the 17th chapter of John, we're given a clue to that. John chapter 17. Now perhaps I should uh, place the setting of John chapter 17 for you again. I, I did this last year. I did it uh, at one of the evening uh, sessions we had. A careful study of the book of John will show that the first six chapters cover the early ministry of Christ and all of the chapters of John, beginning with the seventh chapters, all seventh chapter, all the way the rest of the book described the last six months of his ministry. And most of those, uh, those um, chapters describe the last week of his ministry. And a large part of them describe the last few hours of his ministry. In the 13th chapter, for instance, you have the Lord's Supper in the upper room, the washing of the disciples' feet, and you have that instance when Jesus told them on the morrow he'd be crucified. He would be leaving them. That's in the 13th chapter. Then in the 14th chapter, as they sat around the table there in the upper room the night before his crucifixion, he comforted them with the words that begin, all of you know it, don't you? Let not your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. And he gave this dissertation in the 14th chapter. He introduced the Holy Spirit of God to them as the comforter. At the end of the 14th chapter, you will see the little phrase where Christ says, Arise, let us go hence. At the end of the 14th chapter, they rose up from the table there in the upper room and they started a walk. And they walked down the streets of Jerusalem out the eastern gate down a very steep incline to a little brook called the Brook, brook Kidron, which means the Brook of Cedars. It's dry in the dry season and quite a little brook during the rainy season. So you go down from the east gate. I don't know which is east here. The sun's that way, isn't it? Okay. You go out the east gate of Jerusalem and you walk down a very steep in, uh, decline or slope to this little brooklet. And then you have a steady incline up the Mount of Olives and the short way up the side of the Mount of Olives is the Garden of Gethsemane. Well, they were walking from the upper room in Jerusalem down towards this little brook, which is just outside the east gate of Jerusalem. And all the while, Christ was talking to the disciples. And what he said is recorded in the 15th and 16th chapters of John. If you want to know the last words that uh, the Lord said to his own, you read those chapters because uh, those are they. The 14th chapter in the upper room, the 15th and 16th chapters, as they walked along, through the streets of Jerusalem towards the brook Kidron. Just as he got to the edge of the brook, but he stopped and he pray began praying. And that prayer is to be found in the 17th chapter. They had not yet crossed over the brook. And we have the recorded words of Christ praying for his own. And in the fourth verse of that prayer, he says, this is John 17, 4, I have glorified thee on the earth I have finished the work which thou gavest me to do. In other words, he was saying, I have been the Shekinah glory, and I have 
done always those things which please the Father. I have shown forth the Father. Then he says in chapter 17, 20th verse, he wants you to know who he's praying for. He says, Neither pray I for these alone, but for them also who shall believe on me through their words. Now, who's that? That's us. That's us. You want to hear Christ pray for you? Read the 17th chapter of John. Neither pray I for these alone, but for them also who shall believe on me through their word, that they all may be one, as thou, Father, art in me, and I in thee, that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that thou hast sent me. And the glory which thou gavest me, I have given them, that they may be one, even as we are one. The glory that was in him, he transported to us. The job of being the temple of God on earth, transferred from Christ to us. And that's why he calls us the temple of God. So we're the fifth temple, aren't we? See, Solomon's temple, Ezra's temple, Herod's temple, the body of Jesus Christ, and the body of Jesus Christ. Because we're his body now. See? And we, it's our job to throw, show forth the brilliance, the... the uh, Shekinah glory of God, and the world only sees God on display in the individual lives of Christians, and it's our responsibility to show forth the glory of God to all the world. That's what we're here for. We're the temple of God. Unfortunately, this job of taking the glory of God and his excellence to all the nations of the world will not be completed by this temple either. Because, you see, too many of us use our bodies for our own temple. We pointed out that both Paul and Peter called their bodies a tabernacle. But if you'll read carefully, they referred their, to their bodies as their tabernacle, not God's tabernacle. Their bodies were God's temple, and they used their bodies for themselves as a temporary dwelling place where their own glory was shut up to the world, and their bodies were the temple of God. Now, the cry and shame among the Christian community is that most of us use our bodies for our own temple to show forth our own glory, and we let God use it as a temporary dwelling place when we please to. We're, we're intent upon being wheels in the world. We have an individuality we want to show forth. We want to attract attention to ourselves. We want the world to see our glory. And so we utilize our body for our own temple. And you cannot use your body for the temple of yourself and the temple of God at the same time. Now, and if you insist on doing this, if you will not permit your body to be yielded to God, that his excellence shows forth from your body, and keep your body to yourself strictly as a temporary dwelling place, what will God do about it? What will God do about it? He will take away your ability to be a temple. And the authority for that is right back in our scripture in 1 Corinthians. And you may turn there with me. Now, he wants you to be the temple of God. Jesus Christ, in his high priestly prayer to God, he says, God, this way that I've been glorifying you, I transmit this over to these that will hear from the words of these apostles, these that will be saved down through the ages. 1 Corinthians chapter 3. Verse 9, for we are laborers together with God. Verse 11, for other foundation can no man lay than that is laid which is in Christ Jesus. Now, if any man build upon this foundation gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hand, stubble, every man's work shall be made manifest, for the day shall declare it, because it shall be revealed by fire, and the fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is. If any man's work abide, which he has built upon it, he shall receive a reward. 
If any man's work shall be burned, he shall suffer loss, but he himself shall be saved, yet is by fire. Know ye not that ye are the temple of God, and the Spirit of God dwelleth in you? If any man defile the temple of God, him shall God destroy, for the temple of God is holy, which temple ye are. God will destroy you in this world as a temple for himself. Now, what does that mean? God has called you out for, for himself. He's bought you. He's redeemed you. He's purchased you out of the slave market for a purpose. He wants you to be his temple. He wants to show forth himself to the world through your body, his temple. But if you insist on using your body for your own temple to display your own wares and to be a wheel in the world and important in the world, if you insist on having your way, expressing your own individuality, I do it this way because I want to. If that's your attitude, rather than, oh, I've sought God's mind on this matter, and as best I know, this is the way he wants me to use my body to glorify him. This is the way God wants me to be his temple on this earth. Now, you have a choice. And if you insist on rejecting, now, uh, this is particularly for young people, I'll tell you. I hear many young people say, well, I'm going to have some fun now, or they say it, and maybe not in these words, and when I get a little older, like Mr. Kelso or some of the rest of them, well, then I'm going to surrender to God, and I'll let him use me from then on. You will not because God won't have you, if that's the way you're, uh, you're, you're thinking about it. Because if you defile, if you defile God's temple and continuously defile it, he won't use you for a temple anymore. And that's what it means by the destruction of the temple. Paul speaks about a, a young fellow in the fifth chapter of 1 Corinthians. And this young fellow was living in gross immorality. And he says, if he doesn't repent, turn his body over to Satan. Turn his temple over to Satan. Let it be Satan's temple that his spirit might be saved in that day. Now, this was a truly born-again young man. Didn't mean he was going to hell. It means that God would take away his privilege. Well, we learned from the second chapter, uh, second Corinthians, we learned that this young fellow straightened out and God accepted his repentance. And the whole church uh, was happy about it. Paul, in the ninth chapter, first Corinthians, he says, although, he says, I've done all this work for God, I've been a temple, God is, has glorified himself through my body, he says, I yet fear the day when I might be a castaway or disallowed from the race. He said, this is possible. This is possible. Now, from practicality, how does it come about? How does somebody lose his right to be? How does a Christian, a saved person, lose his right to be the temple of God, to have his temple destroyed, or that is to say, have God turn his temple over to Satan, that Satan might have his glory shown forth from that body as long as it's here on this earth? Oh, what a horrible thought for a redeemed person. Well, let's turn back to Ezekiel. You may have a little hard time finding this. Most Christians don't read much from Ezekiel. But it comes right after Lamentations, which comes right after Jeremiah, which comes right after Isaiah. Ezekiel chapter 10. Ezekiel was in captivity in the land of Babylon with his people, and God gave him a vision, and in this vision, God transported him to the temple in Jerusalem, which was just about to be destroyed. And it says in Ezekiel chapter 10, verse 4, Then the glory of the Lord went up from the cherub, that's where the Shekinah glory stayed, right above the wings of the cherubim, and the glory of the Lord went up from the cherub and stood over the threshold of the house, and the house was filled with the cloud, and the court was full of the brightness of the glory of God. Then we're told some more of the story until we get down to the 18th verse, and it says, Then the glory of the Lord departed off the threshold of the house and stood over the cherubim. And then uh, we read some more about the story until we get down to the 11th chapter, the 16th verse. No, 11.23, where it says, And the glory of the Lord went up from the midst of the city and stood upon the mountain which is on the east of the city. Now let me describe this. Ezekiel saw a vision, and when he got to the place of his vision, which was the temple in Jerusalem, he saw the Shekinah glory of God over the cherubim, where it was supposed to be, right where God intended it. And then, if we had time to read all the story, 
Then he was given a vision of all of the iniquity around that temple, people worshiping idols and trading in God's place and doing all the things God said not to do. And then he saw this glory of God lift itself up from the place where it was supposed to be and transport itself to the threshold of the tabernacle. If you read this sequence, you'd find this. God was so much as saying, I'm not leaving yet. I've only gone part way, and if you'll straighten up your lives, I'll come back where I'm supposed to be. Now, I'm, I mean business, and I've already left the central place, and I've already gone out to the threshold or the doorway of the tabernacle. And then uh, Ezekiel is given another vision of the hardness of the hearts of the people, and the Shekinah glory lifts himself up, lifts itself up from the threshold and places itself out in the courtyard in front of the temple. And uh, then we're shown some more scenes here in the Ezekiel story of how, what God's people were doing and the iniquity that we're doing. And so we come back, and the Shekinah glory lifts itself up from the uh, glory, I mean, from the courtyard, and transports itself clear out of the temple area to the Mount of Olives, the mountain on the east of Jerusalem. And from there, it goes on to be with God. Depart. This is to let you know that God does not depart from your temple without due consideration and without much warning. God is very, very slow to, an to anger. He's a very gracious God. And he deals with his own children. And he deals with them and deals with them. He deals with you about the fact that you want to use your body as your temple in his tabernacle. He deals with you over and over again. And when, he, when you just won't, he removes himself so he seems to be more distant from you. And this is a warning for you to get down on your knees and, oh God, I want to glorify you in my body. I don't want to stray away from you. I don't want to be cast out uh, and disallowed in this race of life. I want to show forth the excellence of God from my own self. It's your opportunity. But if you will not answer that call of God, he'll go a little further out into the courtyard and pretty soon he'll depart from your soul and you'll never again for be permitted in this world to show forth the glory of God. And does that mean you're lost and going to hell? Well, thank God, in Ezekiel, we have uh, some later chapters. And look with me, if you will, in Ezekiel chapter 43. This is after the description of the building of that one glorious temple in the future that Haggai says will be greater than the temple that was in Jerusalem under the reign of Solomon. And he says in Ezekiel chapter 43, verse 1, Afterward he brought me to the gate, even the gate that looketh toward the east. And behold, the glory of God of Israel came from the way of the east. This is the way it went, you know, when it departed the temple. And his voice was like a noise of many waters, and the earth shined like his glory. Actually, this is the presence, this is the actual presence of the Lord Jesus Christ coming back in power to reign from Jerusalem. And it was according to the appearance of the vision which I saw, even according to the vision that I saw when I came to destroy the city. And the visions were like the visions that I saw by the river Kebar. And I fell upon my face, and the glory of the Lord came into the house by the way of the gate, whose prospect is towards the east. And the Spirit took me up and brought me into the inner court. And behold, the glory of the Lord filled the house, even though Israel had all of its iniquities. And even though the glory of God departed, it didn't mean that that was the end of Israel. Because one glorious day in the future, the glory will come back. And our God is so wonderfully gracious, although he may cut you off in this life and say, no, you can have no part here of being part of my glory if you're truly born again, if you've ever been the temple of God. Someday, this wonderful, gracious God will take you back again in the glory, with a glory far beyond the glory that you had at your conversion. It doesn't mean that your God, your Father, cuts you off for eternity. He simply cuts you off in this world because you don't want to show this world the glory of God. You want to show this, this world the glory of you. See the difference? Oh, what a fearsome thing to treat lightly the wonderful privileges granted to us by God. Oh, that my heart's cry might be, God, let my body be for me just a tabernacle, just a temporary dwelling place, just a place of habitation in a desert world, just a tent placed up. God, let me never take this body and decorate it and braid it and, de and, and make it my, my uh, goal and make it uh, my place to show forth my excellence. God, teach me not to cater to this flesh. 
to show forth the excellence that I have. But God, teach me how to yield myself and that I might show forth the glory of God to a lost and dying world which God purposed down through the eternal ages. And my friend, if you will submit your body for that purpose, if you will submit your body to that purpose, oh, the wonderful eternal rewards. Now, does that mean that God wants you to be a non-entity forever? No. He wants you to be willing to hide your life in Christ because the Bible says in the third chapter of Colossians, what God wants to do is to send your individuality back to you for eternity. See, he wants you to uh, trust God to let your own expressions be hidden in Christ now. And then he wants to bring forth your own glory. See, you don't need to be a temple for God in the next world because Jesus Christ will be the temple himself, we're told in Revelation. No, there's going to be a time when God will want you to show forth your own glory. And he's going to give you a glory, a glorious body like you never thought of and like you never dreamed of. And so he just wants you to be willing for just such a short time to suppress your desires and to be willing to trust God that your personality and your expressions be hidden Christ, that he might shine forth. Because one day he's going to bring you an individuality which you never dreamed of. He doesn't want to thwart you. He doesn't want to hide you under a bushel throughout eternity. He has great things planned for you. In matter of fact, in, in uh, Ephesians chapter 2, 7, he says the reason he saved you is because he wants to spend the eternal ages, you sh ages showing you how gracious a God can be to his creature. He has wonderful things in mind for you. Now, why will you take so little now and forfeit so much in the future? It's an awful trade. Young people, it's an awful trade to take yourself to yourself now and forfeit what God has intended for you throughout the eternal ages. Oh, let him use. Trust him to use your body now for his glorification. Now, how do you do this from a practical standpoint. Well, you do it just the way you got saved. You start out by talking to God. You address him. You say, God, as best I know, I want my body to fulfill that purpose for which you saved me. I want to glorify you in this world. This is what I want, God. Please mold me and make me a proper temple for you. So the first thing for you to do is to make up your mind whether you want to be a temple for God or a temple for yourself. You can be either. God didn't take your will away from you. If you want to be a temple for yourself, be a temple for yourself. Don't claim to be a temple for God. But the price is terrific. You trade so much for so little. And if you want to be a temple of God, just tell him that. Say, God, teach me. I trust you to teach me how to be a proper temple for you. Best I know how. I yield my body to you, and I claim it only as a tabernacle, a temporary dwelling place that you can take away any time you want to, because I want it to be a temple for God and just a tabernacle for me. Let's pray. God, we thank you again for this wondrous word. We thank you for this book that's knit together, as we heard last night, as we've read today from all of these various writers that wrote so far apart, and yet they've taken this subject of the temple and tied it together from Genesis to Revelation for our own edification, for our instruction, and for our correction. And God, we pray that we would take this uh, lesson to our hearts and that we would purpose in our hearts to glorify God in our bodies, to show forth the excellence of the great God from our own individual bodies. How we pray that you'd give us this earnest desire. In Jesus' name, amen.